recording. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining Inform CNCSU chapter. Uh, today, uh, it is a continuation of our second event with Dr. Bram Desmond. He is the CEO of Solventure and is an adjunct faculty in Vlarik Business School in Belgium. So he is an expert in the areas of uh, multi echelon inventory optimization. And in his company, he, he takes assistance with Arkiva to give sales and operations planning. He has developed many applications and you know consulting experiences in the last uh, 10 years of his uh, career. So I welcome Dr. Bram. Uh, I hope most of the audience have gone through the first session which we took in the fall semester. He, Dr. Bram was describing about the, the triangle, the, the supply chain triangle, and he exposed what are all the aspects that we need to consider in sales and operations planning. So in today's session, he is going to exclusively talk about multi-echelon inventory optimization and in how this particular optimization techniques can be implemented in the real world system, especially uh, a real world supply chain is not a simple serial structure. It can be a divergent system or it can be an assembly. So most of our students who are exposed to 553 and ISD 723 will be you know, interested in learning this topic. So feel free to ask any questions in between. And before I hand over to Dr. Brown, I request all of you to open your camera, your shutter. We'll take a quick photograph with Dr. Bram, and then I will leave the space with Dr. Bram to proceed forward. I request uh, Wen, Mina, Louis, Catherine, Chinmay. Oh, Stefan has joined. Good evening, Stefan. We are now taking the group photo. Hopefully, everyone Hi. here will have the photo. Yeah, could you just open your camera, Stefan? Um, yeah, let me plug it in. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Chinmay, Luis, Catherine. Oh, yeah. Zoo on your count, okay? You take the picture once Stefan is online. Yeah. I'll also take one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Two big people on sales forecasting as well as optimization on inventory, right? Dr. Ram? <laughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> All right. Three, two, one, zero. Oh, no. One more? One more, yeah. yeah. All right, Dr. Bram, please. Thank you. <clears throat> um, let me share. Okay, give, given the group is not that big, let's make it interactive. So if you have questions, remarks, don't hesitate. Um, I could talk for three days about the subject, which is not my goal. So if you, if you ask the right questions, this will be the, uh, the best uh, guarantee that, that we treat the right uh, topics. Um, okay, Srini already shortly introduced uh, myself. The, uh, as you can see here, <clears throat> multi echelon safety stock optimization was actually the topic of my uh, PhD. So um, it's, uh, let's say it's a topic of special interest. And also in my time as a management consulting, a management consultant, because you can see I did my PhD while I was uh, working as a management consultant. Um, yeah, I also did some uh, optimization projects in uh, multi -echelon. So it was also interesting yeah, let us say not just to do the research, because a lot of research, and especially in the multi echelon domain, a lot of the research, um, let us say, is good in making simplifying assumptions, and uh, and and sometimes academics are very good in simplifying something 
up to the point that mathematically it becomes very elegant to solve. But because we simplify it so much, it has little relation to real life. And one of the struggles in my PhD was to make sure that, okay, some of the complexities that um, I was confronted with as a consultant in real life were also reflected or incorporated in the uh, multi echelon model. And uh, in my research, I made approximations. Uh, so I used normal approximations. Why? Because a lot of the traditional safety stock formulas are based on the normal distribution. And uh, I thought it was elegant to be able to couple back to existing formulas. It would be more easy for people to understand instead of introducing more complex uh, distributions. But to make sure that the approximations worked well, and, and in a certain sense that the approximations were conservative, I also did quite extensive simulation through discrete event uh, simulation. And um, uh, I will show a, a, a brain teaser in a simulation game uh, that one of my colleagues modeled in Enterprise Dynamics, which is a discrete event simulation tool. And, and it's, it's, uh, it illustrates how discrete event simulation can be used also to validate uh, analytical research, I would uh, say, and also how discrete event simulation can be used to yeah, explain to people what multi echelon is about. So th these are some of the topics I want to cover. And um, <clears throat> so, yeah, my, I would say my in-depth expertise is really in inventory optimization. Uh, but yeah, certainly the last three to five years, my, my interest has evolved more into the connection between strategy finance and supply chain. So if people would be interested in the connection between supply chain strategy and finance. So this is my first book, uh, which uh, became available in 2018. And around May this year, there will be a new book, The Strategy Driven Supply Chain, which continues down the topping of integrating finance strategy and supply chain for the people who would be interested. Uh, multi echelon, yeah, some introduction. Um, in general, if you look at inventory, yeah, there are different layers in inventory or different, different drivers of inventory. So uh, there is the cycle stock. If I produce only once per month, yeah, that already creates two weeks of cycle stock on average. If I produce every week, that creates on average half a week of uh, cycle stock. And that is different from the safety stock, which is the typical buffer against uncertainty, uncertainty on the demand side or uncertainty on the supply side, um, which is different from what I call here anticipation stock. And what is anticipation stock? Yeah, absorb a foreseen unbalance between supply and demand. So. Uh, if I have seasonal demand and the peak demand in the peak season exceeds my capacity, then most probably I will need to pre-build some inventory. That's anticipation stock. Or companies could say, I'm shutting down my plant in uh, July or in August for two or three weeks. I anticipate by pre-building some stock. Or I often also see that yeah, around March, we will go live with a new ERP system. And uh, to anticipate potential problems, I will also pre-build some inventory to make sure that I can keep delivering my customers while I migrate to the new ERP system. That's anticipation stock. In process, in transit, uh, because goods are being blocked in production or transport. And then strategic stock is there for strategic reasons. What could that be? Yeah. I anticipate a certain shortage in a key raw material, or I anticipate that one of my competitors will have delivery problems. So whereas anticipation stock, I typically link it to a foreseen unbalance. Uh, you could say strategic stock, I typically link it to yeah, a possible, but not certain uh, unbalance. And um, when I talk to companies, I, I often say, but I'm not too hung up on the exact definition. If, um, if you want to define it differently, 
I would say the, the main thing to do is understand that your inventory is composed of different drivers. Try to understand what the different drivers is. Try to give it a name and try to visualize it. Because I see companies yeah, that end the year with 100 million of inventory and three months later uh, they have 135. So that's a 35% increase. It's 35 million increase in inventory but they don't really know what is causing the increase. Yeah. You will only know what is causing the increase or decrease in inventory if you better understand the different layers or drivers in the inventory. And we will look at inventory in a multi-echelon context. And uh, an example I use here is from the research of Stephen Graves from MIT. It's, it shows a battery supply chain. And um, we see that we have different components or raw materials on the left, which are being uh, yeah, manufactured or assembled into batteries in bulk. These batteries in bulk are being packaged in three variants, eh? SQ, A, B, and C. Maybe it's, uh, I don't know, per six, uh, per 12, and per 18 or per 24, so different packs. What do I need for the packing operation? I, of course, need bulk batteries and I need packaging material. And then the packed SKUs in this case are stored on a central location. Yeah, that could be a plant warehouse. And from the plant warehouse, the packed SKUs are distributed into three DCs, east, central, west. So it's probably modeled after a US example. So that's a multi-echelon production distribution network. And why do we call it multiple echelons? Because there are multiple steps. Yeah, I have here a step with the raw materials, or I could say the raw materials and the packaging. I consider that as one step. Then I have the bulk battery step. I have the packaging step, and then I have the distribution step. So there are multiple steps or multiple echelons. And um, there is an assembly part in it. There is a distribution part in it. And, and when I did my research, I started by analyzing distribution systems. After that, I analyzed assembly systems. And if, if you can deal with both, then you can start coupling them in these type of more generic production distribution networks. And um, okay, we, we want to look at multi-echelon inventory or multi-echelon inventory optimization. Well, this picture shows that we are now looking at inventory at different steps in the network. So the finished product in the regional DC, the finished product in the central DC or the plant warehouse, we can have intermediate inventory, which is the batteries in bulk. And I can also have inventories of raw materials and components. So I have the different steps in the network here. And for each step in the network, I can look at what are the different drivers for the inventory. So if I look at the finished product in the regional DC, what do I have in safety stock? What do I have in cycle stock? What do I have in pipeline stock, buildup, and strategic? And multi-echelon inventory optimization is really about, OK, how do I optimize my inventory across the different steps in the network and understanding that there are different possible drivers for my inventory? So if I just look here at the cycle stock, if I look at cycle stock, typically batch sizes or lot sizes are more uh, significant if I go upstream in the chain. Yeah? Uh, if it's just in distribution, the distribution lot size, typically I'm quite flexible in my distribution. I can pick a box, yeah? I can pick a pallet. If I go upstream, it could be that I say, well, if I manufacture batteries, I prefer to do it in a couple of thousands. So typically the cycle stock will be more important if I go upstream in the supply chain. Yeah. The pipeline stock here is caused by lead time. So yeah, the pipeline stock for the regional DC, yeah, that's the transit inventory in transit from the plant DC to the regional DC. Yeah. And if I look at the raw materials, if there is a lot of pipeline stock, yeah, that it, it depends a bit. Yeah. If I buy in the Far East, yeah, 
And uh, depending on the encode terms, it could be that I already own the inventory once it leaves my supplier in, uh, for instance, China. Yeah? If I already own the inventory when it leaves the supplier in China and it's on the boat, on the boat for four or five weeks, that could significantly drive up my uh, pipeline stock. If I need to yeah, build up stock, yeah, uh, I anticipate, I don't know, a seasonal peak. One of the questions will be, where will I put that build up stock? Yeah? Will I keep it already in the regional DC? Or if I have seasonal stock, will I keep my seasonal stock in my plant DC? That's one of the questions. And if it's strategic stock, where do I keep my strategic stock? Do, do I keep my strategic stock on a finished product level? Or do I say, no, I have sufficient capacity. So what I will do, I will keep my strategic stock in the raw materials and the components, which means if something happens, I will produce more. But of course, if I keep it in raw materials and components, I have more flexibility which specific stock keeping units than actually to produce. So managing multi echelon inventory is really about yeah, how do I manage this total uh, view. Um, build up stock, strategic stock, is typically driven by the planning. When it is about pipeline stock, yeah, transit, work in process, that is driven by how lean is my operation. So if you think about lean manufacturing, uh, lean, lean warehousing or operational excellence. Uh, if, if I improve the leanness of the operation, that will typically reduce the uh, in transit and work in process inventories, the, the pipeline stocks. And uh, when it comes to cycle stocks, safety stocks, this is really driven by the calculation of inventory parameters. And that's where we will spend most, most of the time today. And we will look at multi echelon safety stock optimization. Um, before we dig into safety stock uh, calculations, if, if you look certainly at software, um, when I was doing my PhD, which is like 10 years ago, multi echelon was a hype. And if something becomes a hype, uh, everybody has the capability to do it, right? So, um, so 10 years ago, Every software was multi echelon, yeah, but under the hood, it sometimes just meant that the software was capable to do distribution requirements planning, meaning that based on a forecast in the countries, I do stock netting, I do lead time offsetting, and I can calculate a dependent requirement uh, to my central distribution center. Or multi echelon meant that we were able to do MRP, material requirements planning, which means based on a bill of material and routings, I can take requirements for finished products and I can calculate the dependent requirements for bulk batteries or for raw materials. So some softwares will tell you that this is multi echelon. We will talk about a different type of multi echelon. We will look at multi echelon safety stock optimization. And uh, lately there has been a lot, um, yeah, there has been almost a, a new hype on demand driven MRP. And uh, demand driven MRP is basically going back to the era before MRP was invented. Eh? So instead of coupling the different steps in the network through a bill of material, a routing, eh, or, or a bill of distribution here in the distribution network, we will just take every step in the network on its own. Yeah? And we will only produce bulk batteries once my inventory of bulk batteries has dropped below a certain reorder level. So um, it's, yeah, it's also a way to manage a multi echelon network, but it's not necessarily pretty advanced. Actually, demand driven MRP is going back to the days before uh, MRP. Just some general information around yeah, what is what is multi echelon. Different people will say different things about multi echelon. Um, okay, DRP and MRP are connecting the different steps. Demand driven MRP is instead of connecting them, treating every point in the network separately. 
but uh, what we will be talking about or the focus of this session will be on multi-echelon safety stock optimization and uh, what are techniques to understand how different uh, safety stocks across the different steps in the network are connected. So you could say if I have more or less safety stock of raw materials, how is that a communicating vessel with having more or less safety stock on intermediates or finished products? So we will analyze specifically for safety stocks, how we can connect the different uh, steps in the network. So that's the multi-echelon we will be talking uh, about in this session today. And before we dig in, um, before we dig in to some formulas, I will some show some formulas later on. I want to show a brain teaser, which I typically use to introduce multi-echelon to, to supply chain uh, managers. And um, the question is the following, and I would really like to invite you to take a pen. I'm not sure if I still have a pen here, but in any case, you should have a pen somewhere. So I would encourage you to take a pen, to take a piece of paper, and uh, in a couple of minutes, I will ask you to write down a number. And um, we will look at the following situation. So we say uh, we have a distribution center in Europe, which is centrally located in Brussels. Out of that EDC, the European distribution center, we are replenishing for regional distribution centers uh, in Europe. So most probably we have one RDC North, we have one South, we might have one in the UK and we might have one in the East part of Europe. So the EDC European distribution center is replenishing for regional disease, for RDCs. Um, what are typical lot sizes? Well, the EDC, yeah, the lot size is two weeks. So it means uh, if we order, we order the needs for the next two weeks. Or you could also say that European DC is replenished on average every two weeks. And the EDC is replenished from production in Asia. And if I want to go from Asia all the way into Europe by boat, we assume here that will take eight weeks. The regional DCs have a lot size of one week, which means the RDCs, the regional DCs are replenished on average every week. Eh? Or if we order, we order like the forecast for the next uh, week. The lead time to replenish the RDCs from the EDC, that lead time is three days. So this lead time is relatively short eh? because we have a central DC and we are replenishing the regional DCs within uh, Europe, the lead time here is relatively long. And the distribution lot size is a bit smaller, so we replenish on average every week. And the lot size in the EDC is a bit bigger. We replenish there on average uh, every two weeks. Um, you have five days of safety stock to allocate over the EDC and the RDC. So what's that, what does that mean? It means I can invest five days of safety stock, but it's five days in the total network. So you will need to split it. And what are options to split it? You could say, well, maybe I will keep of the five days, maybe I will keep two days at the central DC, at the EDC. If I keep two days in the central DC, that allows me to put three days in the regional DC. Or I can also do it the other way around. I could say I will put three days in the central DC, in the EDC, which allows me to put two days in the regional DC. Yeah. So these days are, you could say, inter interchangeable. And the question is a bit, uh, will you keep more of the safety stock in the EDC or will you push more of the safety stock towards the RDC? Uh, what else do we know? We know that the target customer service is 99%. And uh, the, the, the customers here are delivered from the regional DC. So what we assume here is that the customers are being delivered from the regional DCs, not from the EDC. 
The EDC is simply replenishing the RDCs and the customers are delivered from the RDC. And our target customer service is 99%. So if you have your pen, I have it here, my pen. If you have a pen, you can't see it because of the, uh, there it is. If you have your pen, please write down for yourself how many days of safety stock do you want to keep at the EDC? How many days of safety stock do you want to keep centrally at the EDC? If you keep two days at the EDC, you will put three days at the RDC. If you keep three days at the EDC, you will put three, two days at the RDC. Now I need, I need a volunteer. I need somebody who is willing to tell me, okay, I'm happy to go. I will put X days at the central DC. I don't know if it's cheating if I go. Who was that? Stefan? Stefan. Oh, no, yeah, you can't. <laughs> so. you, you can give the last. You can give the last. Hey, hey, Bram. So this is Nihir. Hi, Nihir. Hey, so uh, I've, I have solved something like that in one of my case studies earlier. No, in a supply no, 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 no that's not class. allowed. You, you're, you're, stealing, uh, you're stealing my game here, but go <laughs> on. Yeah, but I do understand like uh, the concept here that it is to cover all of the variability in the demand, basically, which will come from the, you know, the places which are closer to the customer. So you want to, you know, pre uh, hold all your inventory as close to the production because the lead times are higher over there, basically, okay. maybe. Yeah. So what would what would be your answer? What have you written down? I have written on five days at EDC, but I'm not sure if that is right. <laughs> yeah, but uh, this is this is a safe environment. We will we will cut this piece out of the recording so that nobody knows what what we actually answered here. I don't have a simulation for five days at the central DC, but I do have a simulation for four days at the central DC. So what I will now, and, and not any, if, if it would be a live session, I try to show it live, but I, I have a small recording here. So what, what we've built um, is yeah, a, a, a simulation model, which um, yeah, simulates what happens if we put four days at the central DC. And if all goes well, uh, you can also hear the sound, which is basically telling the story around it. As a next solution, let's see what happens if we put, so this is test number two. Let's see what happens if we put more of the safety stock at the central level. So for instance, what would happen if we put four days of safety stock at the central level? Four days at the central level means we put one day of safety stock at the regional level. So let's get this simulation started and i will first again slow down the uh, simulation a little bit so before seeing what is the result let's try to think through what is the impact of our decision to put four days of safety stock at the central level how does that influence the simulation we are showing over here? Um, that's, that's not necessarily an easy question. Uh, so four days of safety stock at the central DC, one day of safety stock at the regional DC. How does that influence, you could say, the inputs to this discrete event simulation? Well, remember that we are simulating a reorder point policy. So we order when the on hand plus on order. So if I zoom in again in one of the regional DCs, this is DC number three. We order when the on hand plus on order reaches the reorder point. The reorder point is the average demand during the lead time plus the safety stock. So actually we order 
and the on hand plus on order reaches the reorder point. The reorder point is the de average demand during the lead time plus the safety stock. Actually, the safety stock is shown over here. The safety stock is the blue line. So what we have done compared to the first simulation is in the regional DCs, we have lowered the safety stock from three days to one day. So we have lowered the safety stock, this line, from three days to one day. Or we have also reduced the reorder point with two days. Um, likewise, in the central DC, we have increased. We had two before, now we, we have four days of safety stock. So if I would zoom in over here, yeah, the safety stock, which is the bottom line, we have increased our safety stock from two days to four days, or we have also increased the reorder point with two days. If I zoom out again, let's visualize the stock and the service level. So knowing that we have reduced the safety stock in the regional disease, what is the logical thing to expect? If we reduce the safety stock in the regional disease, of course, we expect that the service level in the regional disease will go down. We have increased the safety stock in the central DC. So, of course, we expect the service level in that central DC to go up. So far, indeed, it seems that, uh, that the central service level is at 98%, which is significantly higher than we had in the first simulation. If I look at the service levels in the regional DC, well, I was close to 99%. I see that the average is now around 96%. So let's see if that balance is kept when we run through the rest of the simulation. And let's see to what type of end result we finally get. So what we see is that the central service level oh, it has been reduced now. Also the decentral service level has been reduced. So yeah, we, are, we end at 93% in the decentral versus 93% in the, the central. So certainly the decentral service level went down and the central service level went up. Now the obvious next simulation we want to do is say, okay, I know that the service level target is actually realized at the decentral level, not at the central level. So what would happen if I put all the safety stock at the decentral level and if I would not keep safety stock at the central level. That's the next simulation we will do. So what this, this video does a couple of things. Eh? It shows how you can use discrete event simulation to simulate uh, reordering policies. And what, what we had built here at the time was a reorder point policy, which when uh, indeed when we hit the reorder point, we order a fixed lot size uh, Q. And um, if I have my four regional DCs simulated here, the demand uh, or the orders of those four regional DCs become the demand to the central DC. And the central DC will have its own reorder policy. You can see here that the reorder point is higher for the central DC. Why is that? Because of the longer lead time. Yeah? If the lead time is 40 days, yeah, the average demand during the lead time becomes 40 days of demand. So, uh, and the difference between the two here is the transit. So at the bottom, you see the actual inventory. At the top here, you see uh, the uh, on-hand inventory plus the in-transit uh, inventory. So you can simulate yeah, uh, you can simulate uh, inventory systems uh, in this way, and you can also play around, which means that um, that was this video was explaining. So the first simulation, I think, was that we were putting three days regionally and two days at the central DC. The second simulation says, well, instead of putting two days at the central DC, let's increase it to four days. So what happens? Well, if we increase from two to four, the safety stock will go up in the central DC, the reorder point will go up in the central DC. But of course, in the regional DC, yeah, I will be reducing the reorder point and reducing the service level. If uh, Sorry, reducing the safety stock. And if I reduce the safety stock, I will reduce the service level in the uh, regional DC. 
So switching back to my uh, presentation. Dr. Bam, quick questions. Yes, um, please. When you do this kind of simulation, what kind of demand pattern you use? What distribution you use? Uh, in, in this case, normally distributed demand. Okay, normally distributed demand. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and uh, let us say a relatively stable demand. You know that uh, if you use a normal distribution, the sigma should not be too big or you get negative value. So this, this, this was a relatively easy and um, yeah, uh, how do you say that? Uh, not, not, not too, uh, a relatively conservative study or uh, assumption. Yeah. Okay. And the second question is about this uh, distributed network system. So if we have a distributed network system, Ideally, with respect to this target service level, which is too much, 99% is too much. So it is better to keep more safety stock at the regional DC level, right? Yeah, I will show the, the simulation results. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, it's fine. I just wanted to show a bit that, I mean, given these, this, the, these are a lot of uh, operations research people that, uh, yeah, you can couple inventory problems to discrete event simulation. And it's something which I did quite intensively in my PhD research. So when I was doing my research, I played the same game with practitioners from multiple companies and multiple sectors. And so the question I have been asking to you, I have asked that in the meantime to many, many supply chain uh, practitioners. Yeah? And um, th this is what people answered. Yeah? So on the left, you see what people answered. And on the right, you see the simulation results so let's let's start on the left so what do we see if i asked people like seven people said i will keep one day at the central dc two p uh, seven people said i will keep two days seven people said i i will keep three days so i often say what do you see on the left well, if you ask practitioners, there is clearly no consensus, right? That's what is shown on the left. If you ask you know, supply chain managers, people who are in charge of managing inventories in production distribution networks, if you ask 10 people, you can get 10 different answers. Yeah, we, we, the only thing we can say is like, in general, we seem, we seem a bit more comfortable uh, with the average solution. We seem a bit more comfortable to split the inventories across the two echelons, keep some of it at the central DC and keep some of it in the market. So there seems to be a slight preference to, to, to split the safety stock over the two echelons. And, and we seem to be a bit more cautious for the extremes and the one person who chose the zero here was uh, somebody who had already seen this uh, simulation so consider that an outlier and on the right we see the simulation results so what mm. do we see well we, we see that okay the, the service level increases the service level increases if we keep less of the safety stock at the central dc if we keep less of it at the central DC, it means we are basically more pushing the safety stock towards the regional DC. Mm. And you see, yeah, every simulation has a slightly different result. Why is that? Yeah, because the demand is random, right? So every simulation has a different demand. That's why the simulation result or the service level is uh, different. But you clearly see the tendency, right? Yeah. If you want to get rid of the variance here, we need to simulate over a longer period of time. If we keep simulating over a longer period of time, the simulation results converge. And these are the simulation results. What does it, what does it say? It says, okay, if I want to get to a 99% service level, the only way to get to 99% is by keeping all of the safety stock at the RDC level. If I reduce the safety stock in the RDC, I see that the service level is going down, which is logical. If I reduce the safety stock, the service level will go down. And of course, I also see that the central service level will then go up. Hmm. Yeah. 
I see that if I keep all of the safety stock at the central DC, I only get to 96%, whereas here I get to 99%. That is because of the batching, because of the lot sizing. Yeah. The demand is more erratic at the central level uh, because of the batching, the lot sizes and distribution. So, okay, for this simple example, we say for a fixed safety stock investment, strategies that put more safety stock in the market provide a better customer service. But if we go back here, yeah, we say, well, the optimal solution is to keep zero at the central level and to push out everything. That's how we get to the 99%. But this is not what people intuitively would do. People intuitively feel more secure if there is safety stock on both echelons, both at the central level and at the regional level. So the typical situation I see in companies is the following. It's shown on the left here. It says, I get to the 99%, which is the target service level, but I do it by having central safety stock and by having regional safety stock. So I get to 99% by keeping four days at the central level and three days at the regional level. So in total, this is seven days of safety stock. This is the typical situation. And uh, at the central level, the service target is a bit lower. So we say, well, if 99% is the target towards the end customer, as an internal target, yeah, we are typically a bit more conservative. We say, well, we don't, maybe we don't 19, need 99%, let's use 95% or 94% or 90%. And why do we accept a lower service target here? Uh, basically, because the reasoning is, well, if I cannot immediately replenish the regional DC, I still have safety stock in that regional DC, right? So maybe the service level in the central DC doesn't need to be 99% because I still have a stock buffer sitting in that regional DC. That's the reasoning behind. Now, if we combine the two, if we say, well, this is where companies are today, this is what is possible. This is on the right. So. What is the opportunity to apply multi-echelon? It says, I can reduce the total safety stock from seven days to five days. So I can reduce from seven days to five days. That is a reduction of two out of seven. seven. That's a reduction of 30%, three zero. Yeah, so I say, I can reduce my safety stock with 30%, three zero while keeping the service level for the customer at 99%. I often say, if I am the CFO of the company, I'm the happiest man in the world. I would say this, that webinar with uh, Dr. Bram, that was really a good investment of your time because we keep the service to the customer and we can reduce inventories with 30%. And this is not theory, this is proven practice. And when we have implemented in practice, this is the type of savings you get. Yeah? Until you are one of the managers of the regional DC. Let's assume that one of the regional DCs is in Spain and you are responsible for the regional DC in Spain. So what is multi echelon for the RDC manager in Spain? He says in the headquarters, they have thought of a new concept. It's called multi-echelon. What is multi-echelon? The RDC manager in Spain will say, I get a lousy internal supplier yeah, because the central DC will no longer keep safety stock. If they no longer keep safety stock, I get a lousy service as DC manager in Spain. And who needs to pay for that? Me, the poor RDC manager of Spain, I need to increase my safety stock from three days to five days. I need to increase from three days to five days. That's an increase of 66%. So the RDC manager in Spain will say in headquarters, they are completely nuts. Plus in general for people, this is not logical. People feel much more comfortable with the solution on the left. The solution on the right, they, they don't understand it. Yeah? It's, it's counterintuitive. So if I am the CFO, if I just look at the bottom figures here and at the customer service level, I'm okay with multi-echelon. 
if I'm one of the RDC managers, I might have a different opinion because I say, well, multi echelon means I get a lousy internal supplier and I need to increase my safety stocks with 66%. So these are some of the practical hurdles you can run into when you, um, let us say, implement uh, multi echelon in practice in companies. Um, any questions here? Principles are clear. Uh, professor, I have one question. Yes, please. Uh, so, uh, like uh, keeping zero at EDC, like completely zero at EDC, is that practical? Like you said, it is a bit counterintuitive. And if we consider that demand is not normal, then how is this? Uh, I mean, how do we ap apply this? Yeah. Okay. That's a very good question. Um, the, the, the result is counterintuitive, but it should not be. Yeah? And the result is not a consequence of the fact that we have used a normal distribution. If the demand would not be normally distributed, or but it would be Poisson distributed, or it would have a different distribution, um, you, you typically come to a comparable result. Yeah? And um, what, what does it mean? Well, actually we say the following. What we are doing on the left is we are almost duplicating the safety stock. Yeah. And because we say I already have safety stock in the market and uh, next to putting safety stock in the market, I'm duplicating the safety stock on the central level. Yeah. And what is multi echelon about? Multi echelon says, well, if I start duplicating or separating risks, it's typically not beneficial. It's like if you think about your insurance policies, if you have an insurance for your house and you have an insurance for the family and you have an insurance for your car, if you give the different insurance policies to different companies, you will always pay more. If you take all the insurance okay. policies and you give them to, to one company, they will give you a better price. Why? Because they say, well, the risk that Monday morning your house burns down, Monday afternoon you crash your car, and Monday evening your child is breaking an expensive piece of art in the museum, it's not very likely, right? So at least I don't hope so. Yeah. And, it, and it's the same over here. We say in a multi echelon network, I certainly already need safety stock on the customer facing echelon. Why? To cover the demand variability. Mm -hmm. And once I already mm -hmm. have safety stock over there, it doesn't provide a lot of value to separately cover, for instance, the lead time variability from the Asian supplier on the central DC. Instead of separately mm -hmm. covering the risk at the central level, it's, it's much better not to cover it here, but to say, I will only put safety stock at the customer facing echelon, which means that all of the risks of the supply chain basically get aggregated at the final echelon. And that's the principle of risk pooling. If I can pool risk, I typically need yeah. to put less safety stock. Yeah. Right. Make sense? And then, yeah. And then the, like the service level that is upstream the RDC or the one, the level that faces the customer. So the service level of everything that is upstream should only be enough to maintain the service level for the customer, like the end yep. service level. Yes, and, and that's of course the key, the key question of multi echelon is how can I calculate this? Eh? If I reduce my safety stock from four days to, to two days to zero, how, how much do I need to compensate at the downstream level? That's the key question of multi echelon modeling. Yeah. So if I reduce my service level at the central DC or I reduce my safety stock, by how far do I need to compensate at the regional DC? So how do I connect those two echelons? That's really the key question of multi echelon safety stock modeling. Yeah, thank you yeah, so good. much. Yeah, good questions. Thanks for the question. I like the interaction. Uh, Dr. Ram, one more question. Yes. Uh, again, um, in a distributed supply chain, um, so far, whatever we discussed is definitely valid. Uh, we are taking and understanding these uh, benefits of keeping 
more safety stock towards the regional side because our service requirements are high at the customer demand facing point. Point well yes. taken. However, yes. however, in a distributed supply chain, it is better to have you know sufficient safety stock at the central warehouse because in the regional side, if there is demand fluctuations and if there are peak and you know slack demands coming here and there. If we have stock in the central warehouse, we can anyway send them. We can send them in you know, bulk and then we can replenish quantities to maintain, especially when it comes to such anticipation stock or something during the peak demand. Suppose if we keep all the safety stock in the regional warehouses, if one uh, regional store or one regional warehouse is having an issue, then it cannot take it from the other regional warehouses unless otherwise transshipment is allowed between the stores. So in this particular scenario, it is better to keep safety stocks in the central warehouse, even though we have a target service requirement at the regional warehouse. So how in practice uh, people generally tackle these kind of problems? Yeah. Well, what, what you say, uh, Srini, is um, it's a common pushback. If I do this story, uh, somebody tells the story like, like you are now telling me. And the, the tricky part is the following. It really depends on how I measure service at the RDC. And uh, if I just go back to our scheme here, <clears throat> if I say service, 99% service means 99% yeah, available in inventory or 99% availability, or I can deliver from stock in the RDC. The problem is that, I mean, in, in general, we feel more secure by having central stock. And so on the one hand, we understand that, yeah, but the only place where we really impact the customer services at the regional DC, but people say, yeah, but if I have the stock at the central location, I can still decide where to send it. Yeah, so if, if right. I'm in the, in, the, in the central DC in Brussels, and I see that there is a stock issue in Spain, I can still decide to send the stock from Belgium to Spain, right? Yeah. If the stock is already in the RDCs, I no longer have control. Correct. But the fallacy is that, yeah, but if I see that there is an issue in Spain, it takes me three days to get there. So by the time I get there, I'm too late. I already had my service issue. And that's why why multi echelon is, is telling us, yeah, instead of keeping it at the central DC, please put it in the RDC. I, I often use the following story. Yeah? There, there is a retailer in Belgium, he is called Kolruyt. And it, they are the biggest food retailer in Belgium. And they have private label uh, products and their private label is called Boni. And I, I tell them the following story. I say, I don't want to be here in the store in Danza. That's the cold red store next to me. And then it's not an RDC, but it's a store. I say, I don't want to be in the store in Danza, seeing that there is no bony milk, bony milk on the shelf. There's no bony milk in the store. Knowing how much bony milk you have in the central DC, because the central DC is assumed to deliver 93% service to the stores and knowing how much bony milk you have at the supplier because the retailer expects a high service level from the supplier. I tell them, I don't want to be in this store seeing that there is no bony milk on the shelf, knowing how much inventory you have in the central DC and because you distrust the supplier knowing how much bony milk there is at the supplier. And I tell them, and by the way, it's private label. It says bony. You are the only retail retailer who sells this. Yeah. What the heck is that inventory doing at the supplier side? Yeah. Your competitors are not going to sell it. It has your name on it. Yeah. So yeah, in, in general, we feel secure by having upstream inventories, but you don't want to be the customer at the end of the chain, which doesn't have the product, while there is a lot of inventory being piled upwards in the, in the supply chain. That doesn't make sense. But it's, it's counterintuitive because then people, people typically say, yeah, but the forecast in Spain is not reliable, eh? or the forecast on the country level is not reliable. 
and the central forecast or the centralized forecast is more reliable. Yeah, that's logical. Eh? Or the demand in the countries has a higher variability, whereas the centralized demand is more stable because the individual fluctuations cancel out each other. But again, I say, if the forecast in Spain is very poor, but you still want to give a good service, you will need to put a lot of safety stock. Correct. Or if the demand is highly variable in Spain and you want to give a good service level, you will need to put a lot of safety stock. Once you put a lot of safety stock, that safety stock acts like a magnet. That safety stock will say, oh, don't duplicate safety stock or risks huh? or separately ensure risk. There is already a big buffer of safety stock over here. It's much wiser to aggregate all of the risks of the full supply chain into one echelon. And basically, you will be putting your safety stock at the only point that you can directly impact the service towards the final customer. Abram, this, yes, I have a question, and maybe you'll get to it. it yeah. You make it sound like, uh, in all cases, it's best to put the all the inventory in your most forward locations, your customer-facing locations. Mm -hmm. What is left to optimize other than determining the actual level in those locations and zero everywhere? What, what is inventory optimization? What's left for it to be optimized? Well, the, the optimization is this. Eh? It says, okay, that this, this is, uh, no, this one. This is the starting point of the company today. And the question is, if I reduce central safety stocks, by how, much, how, by how far do I need to compensate? But we if already I... know that all the upstream locations will have a target of zero. Yeah. All we have to determine now is is it five or is it four or six at the, it's, at it's, the RDC? It's, yeah, it's a bit simplistic. So it, it depends on the cost buildup. Eh? If the product is much cheaper at the upstream location compared to the downstream location, that plays a role. Yeah? But uh, I often say the new reality is that instead of putting safety stock everywhere, the new reality is that I only put safety stock at the customer facing echelon. And maybe I will put safety stock at well-chosen locations upstream, but the, the, the starting point becomes uh, different. And uh, of, of, of course, depending on, on the cost buildup, in, in, instead of having zero days, you might still have 0 0.5 or one day, but no way the service levels at the upstream locations yeah, will be in the 90% range. So, um, so, so in, in, in that sense, if, if you want to simplify things, I often say, well, no, the, the simplification is that we try to avoid having safety stock upstream, or we only put upstream safety stock for well-chosen products. If I say I have a key raw material, that key raw material goes into all of my downstream products. Well, it means if I don't have that key raw material, I simply cannot produce. Well, if you have that single key raw material, it becomes a bottleneck material, then keep safety stock or keep even strategic stock there, right? Uh, another question could be, if you look at the production network, theory of constraint says one, one hour lost in the bottleneck is lost for the system. Yeah? So you never want to starve a bottleneck. So upstream of a bottleneck installation, it makes sense to keep safety stock because you want to make sure that the bottleneck operation is, is, is always running. But, but once, once you take multi-echelon seriously, yeah, the, it really becomes like, okay, I don't put safety stock upstream unless for specific and well-chosen reasons. But this is a hard sell. Eh? It's, uh, people never believe me. And still, I've, I've been telling this for 10 years. I will keep it telling it for the next 10 years as well. Why? Because I also believe in it. It's true. And why do I believe in it? I have extens extensively simulated. If you have time, I will also show a, a, a simulation of that uh, battery supply chain as an example. Oh, well, thanks. How does it work? Yeah, so how do you then connect the dots? Yeah? And, and this is a somewhat simplified model, but still it's a model which illustrates quite well how it works. Yeah? And I also have an Excel 
I have an Excel exercise on that. So if if I would teach in a master uh, in, in in a master course, uh, we do an Excel exercise. I will send the Excel exercise and the explanation and the solution to to Srini. So for for those people who are really triggered. Um, you can try to do the exercise and you will have the solution file uh, included so you can even check your result. Thank you, sir. And um, so it's it's a model after, a, after a, a real life situation. So you may recognize Europe. We have here our central distribution center in Brussels and that central distribution center in Brussels has two functions. So on the one hand, from Brussels, we are replenishing regional disease. So from Brussels, we are replenishing Spain, UK, and Italy. And also from that central DC, we are directly delivering customers in Belgium, France, Germany, and the Netherlands. And that is a common situation that uh, throughout the years, we have been closing regional DC. So probably 10 years ago, we had an RDC in France and we had an RDC in Germany. So we have closed down those RDCs and these markets are now directly delivered from the central DC. It also means that central DC has a double function. On the one hand, we are directly delivering to customers. And on the other hand, we are replenishing regional DCs. And there is a special trick here. So to make sure that we have really multiple echelons, I also said, well, Let's also assume that we have a DC in Portugal and that Portugal is being replenished from Spain. And so that creates an extra echelon. If you want to calculate this, you need some data. So in the Excel file, you will get later, there is affiliate data. And what is that affiliate data? The affiliate is the sales affiliate. It's the sales organization. And this could be typical, this could be an, an SAP output. So uh, the affiliate here is the sales organization, PT is Portugal, ES is Spain, IT is Italy, UK is United Kingdom, France, Netherlands, DE is Deutschland, Germany, and BE is Belgium. 60 indicates it's a sales organization and 10 would indicate a warehouse location. So PT10 is the distribution center in Portugal, ES10 is the distribution center in Spain. And here I can see that France, Netherlands, Germany, and Belgium are delivered directly from the DC in Belgium, whereas some other countries still have their own uh, distribution center. I have a forecast of the last six months and I have my actual sales of the last six months. That's the input. What else do I have? I have a bill of distribution. And the bill of distribution tells me, okay, um, the stock in Portugal, well, actually is being replenished from Spain with a certain average lead time, a certain standard deviation, and I have the landed cost in Portugal. Spain is being replenished from Belgium, four day lead time, one day standard deviation, cost in Spain, 110. Belgium is being replenished from, well, somewhere it stops. So this is where the explosion stops. So basically Belgium is coming from production, but this is where the explosion stops. 28 day lead time, seven day standard deviation. Cost of the product in Belgium, 100. So what do we see? If we go downstream in the network, the landed cost increases. Why? Because we are adding transportation costs. If I go from Belgium to Spain, I'm adding 10 euros. If I go from Spain to Portugal, I'm adding 100 euros. 100 euros, that seems to be a lot for transportation. So what could this be? Well, maybe in Portugal, we have modeled a distributor. Maybe we say yeah, in Portugal, it's not our own inventory. The inventory is owned by a distributor. So if I go from Spain to Portugal, I'm basically selling the product. So I'm also uh, taking a margin. Yeah? And uh, if there is a big increase in costs, and yeah, then the question is, will I still keep pushing stock to Portugal, knowing that the stock in Portugal is way more expensive than the stock in Spain? Yeah? If you follow the Excel exercise, you will see that multi-echelon does it. Yeah? 
multi echelon is still pushing the stock to Portugal, knowing that the stock in Portugal is 100 euro more expensive than the inventory in Spain. Yeah, if you want to see it, you will need to do the Excel exercise. So we have, you could say the sales information, yeah? what do we sell in the countries and where are these countries delivered from? And then we have the replenishment information. So which DC is being replenished from which source with which lead time. And we also provide cost information. And then yeah, the, 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 the mechanism is that you say, I start from the affiliate information, the sales information. So Portugal, this is the demand and it's delivered from the DC in Portugal. And the bill of distribution tells me, yeah, but Portugal is replenished from Spain. Spain is replenished from Belgium. And uh, using that bill of distribution, we are calculating the dependent amount. So, uh, what I say, well, if I want to sell the 217 in Portugal, at some point in time, I will need to ship the 217 from Belgium to Spain, and then I will need to ship them from Spain to Portugal, right? And um, what I get if I do that explosion is in some DCs, I get two types of demand. So in, in Spain, I have two types of demand. I have the customer demand from the customers in Spain, and I have a replenishment demand, yeah, which is coming from the DC in Portugal. Also in the DC in Belgium, BE10, I will have two types of demand. I will have customer demand. The DC in Belgium has customer demand from Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, France, and the surrounding countries. And Belgium has replenishment demand from three DCs. It needs to replenish UK, Italy, and Spain. And so upstream in the network, I can have two types of demand. If we do a safety stock calculation to make things easy here, we will say, well, we will calculate one safety stock per type of demand. So I will calculate the safety stock yeah, here for the customer demand in Spain, and I will calculate the safety stock for replenishment demand in Spain. Yeah. Not sure by how far you are familiar with safety stock formulas, but a safety stock formula typically looks at a Z factor or a K factor, which is linked to the service, through the service level. And linking the Z factor to the service level is done through the inverse standard normal distribution norm as in inverse standard normal distribution. Yeah. That's the K factor or the Z factor. And then I have a square root and that square root, under the square root, I have the uncertainty. So here I say, well, I look at the demand variability during the lead time. So if it's in Spain, it's the demand variability on the customer demand in Spain or on the replenishment demand in Spain multiplied with the lead time to replenish Spain from Belgium. And then the second part of the equation or, or, or under the square root here is the uh, lead time variability. So I say, well, the lead time to replenish Spain from Belgium is not constant, eh? it's stochastic. So I look at the variability on the lead time. And again, I multiply that with the average demand and for the customer safety stock, it's the customer demand. For the replenishment safety stock, it's the replenishment demand. If, if companies do that, yeah, you often see that customer service levels are somewhat higher, 95% or 99%. Yeah, the service levels for replenishments are typically already a little bit lower. Yeah, why are they a bit lower? Well, companies are under pressure to reduce inventories. And because they are under pressure to reduce inventories, supply chain managers have already typically reduced the service level a little bit. And why do they dare to reduce the service level here? They say, well, I will reduce the service level for replenishments from 95 to 90%. Why? Well, there is still safety stock in Portugal as well, right? So maybe I don't need 95% service level for Portugal because they also have some safety stock left. And then of course the question becomes, yeah, but yeah, if, if I don't need 95% for the replenishments and I can do with 90%, can I not do with 85% or with 80%? That was really the question I got 
when I was a consultant, which led me to the PhD. And uh, I started thinking through, yeah, but okay, what happens if I reduce that service level for the replenishment? Well, if I reduce my service level here for the replenishments in Spain, well, the good news is that my safety stock will go down. What is the bad news? Well, if Portugal orders on Spain and there is less safety stock, I will not always have inventory. Right? So if I reduce my service level, the good news is the safety stock will go down for the replenishments. But the bad news is, yeah, Portugal orders on Spain, but the, if there is no safety stock for the replenishment flow, from time to time, I will not have stock for Portugal. If I don't have stock, what will happen? The orders will need to wait. Portugal will order on Spain, ah, there is no stock. The order is waiting there. So if I lower the safety stocks for the replenishments in Spain, the, the replenishment orders of Portugal will incur a waiting time. That's, that's what we will try to model. So how will we model that? Yeah. Uh, these, these are some uh, notations. We, we say, okay, we will model an outgoing service time, outgoing service time in Spain. O is outgoing, ES is Spain, and R is it's for replenishment orders. We will model an outgoing service time and we will model it as follows. We will say, Let's take one minus the service level times the lead time in Spain. And what does that mean? If my service level for replenishments is 100%, if the service level is 100%, there is no waiting time. It's logical. Eh? If there is 100% service, there will not be a waiting time. There will not be a service time. Yeah? If I start reducing the service level for the replenishments, my outgoing service time or that waiting time starts to increase. And if my service level would go all the way down to 0%, I say, well, the maximum for the service time is really the total lead time in Spain, right? So that's, and I say here, different authors assume different models here. This is a simplified assumption, right? In the PhD, it's a bit more complex, but this is helpful just to, to think it through. And uh, so the two extremes, again, would be if my service level is 100%, so if I have a huge safety stock in Spain, there will not be a waiting time or a service time. And on the other extreme, yeah, if my service level is 0%, well, the, the, the maximum service time I assume here is really the lead time to replenish Spain from Belgium. Um, if I model that, uh, from the Portugal perspective, I say, okay, from a Portugal perspective, I look at an incoming service time. Yeah? So Portugal says, what is the incoming service time for me? Well, the incoming service time for Portugal is the outgoing service time of the predecessor. Yeah? So what is incoming to Portugal is outgoing for uh, Spain. Yeah? And, and what is important is that if I calculate safety stocks for Portugal, yeah, we talk here about the nominal lead time, yeah, and that nominal lead time is the lead time assuming that the goods are available. So the, the zero here, the nominal lead time, is assuming the goods are available. So it's basically the time to pick and pack the goods in Spain, to put them on a truck, drive them to Portugal, and to do the goods receipt in Portugal. That's the nominal lead time. It assumes the inventory is there and the transportation, the warehousing and transportation process can start. But if I calculate my safety stocks in Portugal, I don't just need to look at the nominal lead time. I also need to account for that service time or that waiting time. So if I calculate my safety stocks in Portugal, I need to look at the actual or the total lead time. And that is the nominal lead time, the two days, to do the pick and pack transportation and goods receipt. But I also need to look at the waiting time, that incoming service time. And the incoming service time for Portugal is the outgoing of the predecessor. The outgoing of Spain, we modeled it as one minus the service level times the lead time of Spain. 
if we assume normally distributed lead times, we are summing normal distribution. So if this is normally distributed and this is normally distributed, the sum of two normally distributed variables is again normally distributed. Yeah? The average is the sum of the averages. And beware in statistics, never sum standard deviations. You need to sum variances. Eh? So we will sum the variances and then take the square root. So, okay, this seems complex, but is this helpful? Yeah, it is helpful because actually what we did is the following. We have coupled the service level in Spain to the replenishment lead time of Portugal. That's what we have done. And how, what, what actually have we been doing? We say, okay, if I reduce the service level in Spain, Again, what is the good news? The good news is that the safety stock in Spain will go down. What is the bad news? Uh, the bad news is that I create a waiting time for Portugal. If I don't have stock, the, the orders of Portugal will be waiting. I create a waiting time. We call that the service time. Okay? And for the safety stock in Portugal, we need to take a, take, take a look at the total lead time, and not just the two days physical transportation, but also include the waiting time, the service time. Well, we said, yeah, if we reduce the service level here, it will increase the waiting time or the service time for Portugal. So it will increase the lead time in Portugal. If it increases the lead time in Portugal, it will increase the safety stock in Portugal. So we have connected the two echelons. That's what we have done. And now it becomes an optimization problem. Eh? I say the 90% is a decision variable. And I say, please find the central service level, which is minimizing the sum of these two safety stocks. And I don't want to do the optimization in pieces because I know that the pieces in Portugal are much more expensive than the pieces in Spain. So I will not do the optimization in pieces. I will do the optimization in dollars. That's, that's relatively easy to do. Again, I will send the Excel file. There is also a PDF which describes the exercise. And uh, if, if you can, and I will also send uh, the solution file if you, if you try it, you can see for yourself how this works. You can even put the Excel solver on top of this as an optimization question. Yeah, so it becomes an optimization problem. And, and this is the same, but this is really with the more detailed formulas. Yeah, so if we look at Spain and Portugal, what do we have? We have the safety stock in Spain for the customer demand. This is the C. Yeah, that always needs a high service level. It's focused on the customer demand, so we don't really touch that. The optimization piece is really over here. We say I have in Spain safety stock for replenishment, so basically for the replenishment orders coming from Portugal. And what I say here is that, okay, I have a service level for replenishments. If I reduce that service level for replenishments, the safety stock in Spain will go down. And that's the good news. The bad news is, Ah, this is my waiting time here. That waiting time was modeled as one minus the service level times the lead time of Spain. So if I reduce my service level, if this is going down, one minus is going up. So the waiting time is going up. So the total lead time for Portugal is going up. So the safety stock in Portugal will be going up. So modeling of service times and waiting times, that's really the essence of multi-echelon modeling. That's how we make the connection between different uh, echelons in the chain. And uh, we won't do the exercise yet, but I will, I will send it to you. So if people are interested, uh, you might be happy to take a look at it. Centralizing inventory. So, People are also sometimes confused because in a lot of basic trainings, they say uh, if you can centralize inventories, it reduces the safety stock requirement. And it seems like multi echelon is in conflict with that finding. Eh? Well, uh, which one is wrong? 
centralizing reduces the safety stock? Is that wrong? Or is multi-echelon wrong, where multi-echelon says, well, no, you don't need to centralize the inventory, you need to push it out. I will show that both are correct. Centralizing inventories reduces the inventory requirement. The typical example is I have four identical DCs. What happens if I close the four identical DCs and I regroup everything into one DC? If you do some calculations, you could say, well, my safety stock here is four times the safety stock. If I centralize all of the demand, what do I get? Uh, if I look at my centralized demand, again, I need to sum the demand variances. But if it's identical disease, it's four times the same demand variance. So what I will get is square root four times sigma demand. So I go from four times sigma demand to square root four sigma demand. So I go from a factor four to a factor two. So if I take four identical DCs and I can combine them into one DC, it will half the safety stock requirement. So it is correct. Centralizing inventories is reducing the safety stock requirement. The problem is the following. The problem is that sometimes uh, you cannot close regional DCs. Why? Because of lead time requirements. If I need to get by truck from Brussels to the south of Spain, it takes me four to five days. Uh, and customers may say, yeah, I, can, I, cannot, I cannot accept a four or five day lead time, right? All your competitors are delivering within 24 hours or 48 hours. Well, if in Europe you need to deliver in 24 hours or in 48 hours, you will need multiple DCs. And I cannot just close DCs and regroup everything into one. If I cannot close DCs, that's when I really end up in a multi-echelon situation. And in a multi-echelon situation, the question becomes the following. Am I going to split the safety stock over two echelons? Or am I going to, yeah, I would say, aggregate all of the risks into one echelon? And it's that same principle of risk pooling, which tells us, well, it's better to aggregate all of the risks into one echelon. Which echelon? I, I always need safety stock in the regional DC. Why? If I don't have safety stocks, I, I can never deliver service because of the demand uncertainty. So because I already need safety stock in the regional DCs, kind of automatically all the risks will get aggregated on that customer facing echelon. And, and the best way I have found to explain to practitioners is to talk about safety stock duplication. That's when we understand. And then people say, ah, yes, indeed, we don't want to duplicate safety stocks. Well, that's what you would do when you put safety stock on both the central level and the regional level. But the conclusion remains, if, if you can close the DC in Spain, you should always do it. And because from an inventory perspective, Closing regional DCs and aggregating everything into one central DC from an inventory perspective will be better. The problem is I cannot always do that because of a lead time constraint. If I have multiple DCs and I end up with a multi-echelon situation, then it's typically better to put to aggregate all of the safety stock at one echelon. And depending on the cost structure, maybe I keep a little bit of safety stock upstream but it will rather become the exception than the norm. So we really need to take a different starting point. So it's the same principle of risk pooling, which leads to a different conclusion, depending on the type of environment we have. I would like to quickly cover this as a last topic. So what happens if we go back to that generic production distribution network? Yeah? And this is our battery supply chain, which I introduced in the beginning. Does the same principle hold? The answer is yes. So what, what we say here is the following, okay? We say, what happens if I lower my service level on 
my components and raw materials. Well, if I lower my service levels on my raw materials, the good news is the safety stock on the raw materials will go down. What is the bad news? Yeah, the bad news is that I'm creating a waiting time for my battery manufacturing. I want to start manufacturing batteries, but I don't have nail wire or I don't have spun zinc or I don't have EMD. Yeah. So I'm creating a waiting time for my bulk battery manufacturing. If I'm increasing the lead time, the safety stock on my bulk batteries will go up. But then I can redo the trick. I can say, well, what happens if I reduce my service level on the bulk batteries and on the packaging material? If I reduce my service levels, the good news is the safety stocks will go down. What's the bad news? I will create a waiting time for my packaging operation. Because the packaging operation will say, I, I want to I wanna start packing, but I don't have packaging material or I don't have bulk batteries. Uh, if my lead time increases here, I will need to increase my safety stock or it will increase my safety stock on the packed SKUs. And then the last thing we already did, if I reduce my service level on the packed SKUs, my safety stock will go down. It will create a waiting time for the replenishments because the lead time increases my safety stock in the regional disease will go up. And uh, yeah, the question almost becomes in that multi echelon context, please find the upstream service levels that minimize the total system safety stock. And this, this is what is shown over here. So um, this is the single echelon situation where we have safety stock for 95% service level on each of the echelons. And this is the multi echelon situation where I say, I have optimized and the conclusion is that I will not keep upstream safety stocks. I will only keep safety stocks at the customer facing echelon. There is a reduction from 1.19 million. That's the dark blue to 0 0.34. That's the light gray. So it is a 70% reduction in system safety stock. Watch out on the finished product level. I need to increase from 0 0.2 to 0 0.34. So again, on the customer facing echelon, there is a significant increase of 70%. And there is a simulated service level of 96%, which is above the 95% target. So it's not just theory, it works. And the biggest hurdle becomes here, yeah, but how flexible is my manufacturing here? And how flexible is my packaging? It depends on how lean is the operation. If you are a Japanese lean manufacturing company, well, if you can't package a specific SKU, then, will you, then you will do something else. Or if I can't produce this type of batteries, then maybe I can produce something else. So if you have sufficient flexibility, that if you don't have all the components available, you can do something else, then there is not really a quality loss, right? So then it's not just theory but it really becomes practice. And I quickly want to show, and that's then the last thing I want to show. I want to show that simulation also, if I have it here, yeah. I want to show the simulation for that battery supply chain. So an extra simulation I want to show is a simulation of the um, battery supply chain. So what we did uh, in my PhD, deep period together with a colleague was built um, a discrete event simulation model where we could easily load different types of supply chain so this is actually the battery supply chain so remember that we have here a couple of uh, components that go into bulk batteries these are the component inventories which are resupplied from an outside supplier so this is the inventory at the outside supplier and in this simulation we assume the supplier has inventory to meet our demands the batteries in bulk are packaged into three variants one two three for the packaging operation which is the yellow block here i need the bulk batteries and i need packaging material which is again uh, ordered from an outside supplier and the three packaging variants one two and three are then shipped into uh, my regional dc so this one goes into a regional dc 
um, goes into the second regional DC, goes into the third regional DC, and also my second packaging variant goes into DC 1, 2, and 3. So I can say that I have an assembly operation here. I actually have two of them. So I first assemble the batteries, uh, the bulk batteries. Also for the packaging operation, I have bulk batteries and packaging. So it's also a converging network and then I have a distribution activity which is typically a diverging network. And then I can run demand through this network. So if I start simulating, um, what I basically do is uh, I simulate demand uh, or I generate demand and I fire that demand to the regional uh, DCs for the finished products. Those regional DCs will work according to a, a reordering policy. In this case, again, a, a reorder point, fixed reorder point, and then a fixed lot size. And as the regional DCs order product to the plant DC, those replenishment orders will become the demand of the plant DC. The plant DC is also regulated by a reorder point policy. So when the on hand plus on order drops below the reorder point, we order a fixed lot size to the assembly operation. And uh, in this way, we can basically simulate a somewhat more complex uh, network. So the, the, the small dots you see moving here, these are actually um, yeah, the replenishment orders. Yeah. If you see many of those dots, it typically means that there is a long lead time, so there is a lot of in-transit inventory. If you see less dots, typically the lead times are smaller and there is less in-transit uh, inventory. So we can then zoom in. So we can zoom in and basically if you click here on an inventory point, you can see what the demand is for that product and what the reorder point is and uh, as before when we see the um, reorder point we see the on hand inventory we can uh, simulate uh, service levels right so also if you look at the upstream stock points you can see what is the on hand plus on order and what is the actual inventory yeah. um, if you lower the upstream safety stocks of course you will get service issues over there but if you compensate by putting more safety stock at the regional DCs the question remains the same uh, what is now the best how much safety stock should we carry upstream in the network or is it better to pool all of the risk at the customer facing echelon and using this type of discrete event simulations yeah, basically we have simulated different alternatives so We've run simulations where we put a lot of safety stock in each of the intermediate stocking points and you can then simulate situations where you don't keep safety stock of raw materials or intermediates and you basically try to shift most of the safety stock to the customer facing uh, echelon. That's uh, what we've done in the context of the PhD research. But of course you could also easily do that for real life supply chains with real life demand uh, to test whether a calculated option is also feasible in practice. Okay, so this is what I had foreseen for this session today. Not sure if there's not, there are other questions. I have a question. Uh, very interesting, those uh, simulations. Mm -hmm. um, did you uh, consider negative safety stocks in your simulations? Um, why would zero be the optimal? Why not minus uh, one or minus no, five? The, the, um, the optimum is not uh, zero. Eh? That's what you find. Eh? It's, uh, uh, I mean, it's the, the optimum is not at zero safety stock, but it is below zero safety stock. And um, we... I mean, we didn't simulate it. Why? Because the approximations I developed in my PhD were reliable for the positive safety stock zone. But if, if your safety stock becomes negative, um, yeah, your average inventory calculation becomes different. And uh, 
yeah what i developed was not i mean the, the modeling was not reliable enough so we we would still have been able to simulate what it was but i was no longer able to to predict where the optimum was going to be so the the lowest optimum i was able to find was at zero safety stock and also at the time we, we were doing that in projects it was already difficult to explain zero safety stock i i i didn't try to explain negative safety stocks which which basically means that you just further lower the reorder point and that you deliberately start accumulating back orders uh, which is also a kind of uh, pooling in the sense that um, I have supply coming in from Asia. I'm deliberately pooling back orders. And as the supply comes in, I will gradually start delivering or replenishing regional DC. So it, it, in practice, it makes a lot of sense, but it was already so hard to explain zero safety stock that I never had the courage to try to explain zero uh, negative safety stocks, not even to my colleague supply chain consultants. And um, also the approximations I developed, they were, were not uh, accurate enough to make good predictions in that negative safety stock zone. Maybe that's uh, for all the students on, uh, on the call that uh, one of them might be courageous enough to yep. do a PhD yep. study on that. Just to, be sure, just to be sure, I will also send my PhD thesis to Srini so that he can send it to the students. Uh, oh, absolutely. First, I need <laughs> to fully understand that and read it. I mean, I, I appreciate what Stefan was asking, but don't we do in research, uh, instead of considering the service level and the safety stock, if we consider the inventory position as such, so we can still formulate the problem and the inventory position can go either negative or as well as positive. And accordingly, we can calculate what would be the right safety. I mean, what is that service level, critical fractal, whatever we call that. That could be a way to expand this, right? Yes. Okay. So, okay. so, 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 so Ari, it's uh, the, the zero safety stock is a kind of an artificial limit. And uh, if I would ever do another PhD, uh, yeah, it would <laughs> certainly be a, a topic to further explore and expand. Okay. Any questions from the audience? We got a very good opportunity today. Dr. Bram discussed multi echelon inventory multi echelon safety stock optimization. And he gave two case studies on live. He showed the discrete event system simulation and it's two different practical problems, right? So which we always encounter, what we need to do with respect to service level and should we need to give priority to supply chain cost or we need to give priority to the service level because both are investment proportional. Uh, and his, his experience and his consulting days clearly proves that where, what is your objective accordingly, you need to freeze your inventory, either at the customer facing side, or if you are in the, in the other aspect of the supply chain where you will keep some storage of inventory in the upstream of the supply chain. Any, any last questions from the audience before we close our uh, day today? Yes, I do have a question. So go, go ahead. ahead back to the simulation model that you asked us to do um you have a you have a from the from a edc to rdc as three days uh let's change our scenarios to um let's say three three weeks well 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 we still have the same conclusion yes so I've, I've changed many things. Then people said, yeah, but what if instead of four RDCs, we would have 20 RDCs? Or what if instead of the lead time being three days, the lead time would be three weeks? Or what if we would turn it around? What if we have three days to the central DC and three weeks to the, uh, or three days for the central DC and then eight weeks to replenish the regional DCs? What if the cost in the central DC is one and in the regional DC is 1.5 or is two? So in, in general, we, we try to look for reasons not to have to believe the multi-echelon conclusion. Yeah, it's like um, we, 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 try to, um, we try to push it back. And um, I'm not saying that you will never keep central safety stock. 
but the central safety stock will never be there to realize a 90% service level. So it will always be a situation where yeah, maybe you then get to 70% or 75% or maybe 80%. So in any case, the new reality is that we don't, we don't try to deliver good service from the central DC, no. We, 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 we will push a bit more of the safety stock downstream and we might keep some buffer or we might keep no buffer at all, or we might even keep the negative safety stock that Stefan was talking about. And um, it also doesn't mean that, that the central DC doesn't have a, a, a pooling effect because if, if I go back to that example, so, so some people then say, okay, so we don't put safety stock so we can close the DC. And I know, no, that's not the case. If I would close the EDC, then all of the RDCs would face three days plus eight weeks lead time. That's not what I want. Huh? It's not because I'm not keeping safety stock that the EDC doesn't have a risk pooling function because I say, instead of each of the RDCs individually ordering to the East, what we do is no, we place one central order from the EDC. We place it to the supplier in Asia, our production in Asia, when at the moment when the goods arrive in the EDC, only at that point we decide to whom to send it. So as long as it's traveling here in the chain, we are still pooling the risk of the, of the different RDC. So if, if one RDC would sell more and another sells less, yeah, we can really wait for the last possible moment to decide to whom to send the supply which is coming in from Asia. So, um, that's that's another uh, thing I, I, I typically get as a question. Yeah, and uh, if I may add, Bram, um, what people don't realize is that cycle stock also provides service. Yeah. Yeah. So even if you have zero safety stock in your EDC, you still have cycle stock. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and then after after removing the safety stock, the next step is that you push out the cycle stock. And also there in the literature, yeah, there there are models on if I get supplied once every two weeks, what do I do? Do I wait for the RDCs to order and to pull on that central stock or no? Do I say when the supply arrives, I push it out. Yeah. And, and, and also there, there is research which, which suggests, but don't wait for the RDCs to order. Yeah. Once the supply arrives, that a, a typical model is the two-step push. So it says, when the supply comes in, push out 80%. You don't want to push out 100% because then you no longer can correct, but you want to push out enough yeah, because you want to bring the inventory closer to the customer. So I push out 80% immediately and I push the remaining 20% after half of the period. So if I get replenished every two weeks, when it comes in, I push out 80% and the remaining 20% I push out after one week. And, and that means that that central DC almost becomes a kind of a cross docking function. And, and I tell the same to retailers. I tell to retailers like, yeah, central safety stock. And again, I told the example, I don't want to be in the shop in Danza seeing that there is no milk, knowing how much milk you have in the central DC, it doesn't make sense, right? So you don't need to keep inventory in the central DC. It doesn't mean that the central DC doesn't have a function. Eh? For a retailer, the central DC has a consolidation function because it's consolidating different flows coming from different suppliers. It has a consolidation function, yeah, but don't keep inventory there, right? Because if you keep inventory, it's, it's only consuming the shelf life in case of fresh products. But it's, it's frightening for DC managers because they, they built a new DC, which is huge with a lot of wrecks in it. And then somebody is telling them that they shouldn't be keeping inventory in that central DC and, they, and that they just should push it out. So our brains are not wired for multi echelon conclusions. And typically also supply chains are not designed for multi echelon conclusions, but okay. At the same time, I'm, I'm patient because there is a huge opportunity to reduce inventories through multi-echelon in a smart way. 
the pressure on inventory is always increasing with companies. So sooner or later, companies will start applying it. It's only a matter of time. And once they start supplying it, then maybe they will start believing what I'm trying to tell them the last 10 years. <laughs> we look forward. Thank you so much, Dr. <laughs> Bram. Uh, <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> thanks, uh, Stefan, for joining us today. And thanks all the participants. Once Dr. Bram shares the presentation, the, the simulation game, the data, I will keep you all posted so you guys can play around and come out with numbers. Probably we will have a separate meeting offline. So I look forward for the future meetings. Uh, if you guys have uh, registered for the next week's event, it's all about supply chain risk management from Resilink. You are most welcome to you know, register to the links. Thanks once again. Thanks, Dr. Brahm, and have a great weekend night. Thank My you, pleasure. Enjoy the rest of the Bye. day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.